You see, I was uh, born into a very wealthy family in Northern California. We had a large ranching operation, a herd, a dairy herds, and all kinds of fruit orchards, and grape vineyards, hay fields. We had everything in the world that one could want on a ranch. And that was only a hobby for my father, for he was a building contractor. He built hotels in San Francisco and Oakland, and the ranching operations were just his plaything for the weekends. We lived in a huge home with wealth all around us, a great library in our home. And we had everything in the world that one could desire except the Lord Jesus Christ. My father was the son of a Methodist minister. My mother came from a very professional family in medicine and education. Both of these people were quite religious, very religious in their youth, but somehow they separated themselves from the Lord Jesus and forgot him. And so five boys grew up without even knowing that God existed. In addition to that, we had a boat harbor as well. I suppose if you were to buy all the things we had, it'd take about $17 million. And God took it all away. And oh, I am so grateful that we no longer have the Harris contracting firm, no longer the Harris ranching operations, and no longer the Harris boat harbor. God took it all away and we moved into a tiny little one-room shack on the levee of a river. And I was, I think, nine or ten years of age when I first heard the name God other than in cursing. I knew absolutely nothing spiritual. My father seemed to have a Midas touch in everything that he uh, connected himself with and the contracting business kind of came back to a degree. And through those years, again, I heard nothing of the Word of God except in cursing and blasphemy. Only that one time, when I was nine or ten, had I heard something about God in heaven. I attended Mass, you see. Uh, I tried to steal the offering, got hit on the head by a deacon, had to put the money back in the container. And that's about all I knew about religion. It was a place where you got hit on the head, you had to give back the money you tried to steal, and it was a funny-looking place anyway. When I entered into uh, the Air Force in the beginning of World War II, I went, you see, without any spiritual reserves because I didn't know anything. And when you're tossed into that kind of environment, you can believe me, if you don't have spiritual qualities or spiritual reserves to draw on, there's no way you're going to find uh, your way out of that kind of a mess except by a miracle of God. When I went into the Air Force, I was... Uh, sent down to Biloxi, Mississippi. And I took my basic training there, and then I was sent to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I took a specialized aircraft, airframe, and mechanics course in preparation for flight engineers training at Boeing Aircraft. And while I was in Lincoln, one of the fellows in my barrack took a, barracks took a very keen interest in me. He saw I needed God very, very desperately, and one day he came to me, and he said, Harris, why don't you read this? And he handed me a Bible. And I said, what's that? Well, he said, it's the Bible. I said, what's the Bible? You know, I didn't even know what a Bible was. I'd never seen one in my life. He said, well, it's the Word of God. Well, who's God? Why, he created you. God never created me. We came from the monkeys. Now, that's what I had learned in school and in my science classes. Oh, he says, no, no, no. God created you. And if you read this book, you'll find out about it. Well, I was a very avid reader. And I opened the Bible up and I began reading, In the beginning God created. Well, I read through those few verses about creation, and I got stuck in the these and thous, the old uh, English, and I closed the book and I was, I just didn't have the slightest bit of interest in that kind of a story about creation. Well, this fellow was not easily uh, turned aside, and he was at my side uh, just a few days later, and he said, Harris, why don't you come to the chapel with me and hear Chaplain Payne? And said, That's probably what it would be, all right. He's a great big pain hearing that fellow. I didn't know what a chapel really was. I had never been inside of one, but I thought there was a lot of hocus-pocus that went on in those kind of places, and I didn't want to be a part of it. But he kept pressuring and pressuring. You know how people can do that, and I got mad at him. And I doubled up my fist, and I said, Gilbert Henry, if you don't shut up, I'm going to put my fist right down your throat. 
If you do shut up, I'll go with you. you know, I thought I'd scare him off like that. Oh, he said, I'll shut right up. Well, a quarter past seven on that Sunday evening, he was standing right there next to my bunk. And he said, okay, Harris, it's time to go. I said, go where? Well, you promised to come to the chapel with me. Well, young people, my father, with all of his deficiencies, had one exceptional quality. He was a man of his word. And he taught us five boys that whatever you say you're going to do, you do it. Your word is your bond. You need no contract. Your word is your bond. Now, that's how he built hotels without contracts, only his word. And he instilled that very deeply in us. Well, I was stuck. I had promised to go, so go I had to do. And I went into the chapel with him, and wouldn't you know there were only two seats left in that whole chapel, and they were halfway back on the right side, and Gilbert Henry spot, spotted those two seats, and he had me into one before I could turn around and run out the door. And just at that moment, Chaplain Payne raced onto the platform. Now, this man ran everywhere he went. He ran out of the out of the side room there on the chancel, onto the platform, and he opened up the Bible, and he began preaching my land about things I'd never heard of in my life, about down under the ground were great boiling cauldrons of oil, and down there were all of, where all of the sinners were, and the devil was down there with a big pitchfork, and he was sticking the sinners with a pitchfork, and he was chucking them into a big pot of oil, and they would roast and burn there for a few million years, and when that cooled off a little bit, he'd take them out with a pitchfork and stick them in another one ten times hotter. Now, that's what this man was preaching from the pulpit. In my land, I said to my God, I never heard of those kind of things being done under the ground, and I didn't know they were there. And then he talked about heaven. And all of the saints, whoever they were, were floating around on the edge of clouds playing harps. And I thought, good night, what a place that must be, sitting on the edge of a cloud playing a harp for millions of years. And I didn't know which was worse, to do that or be down there. And when he finished his sermon, he made a call, and he said, uh, stand up. And that was an officer's order, so we all had to stand up. <laughs> and he said, I dare you sinners, it looked like he pointed right at me, I dare you sinners to come right down that aisle and go into that room over there. Well, before I knew what happened, Gilbert Henry had me by the back of my pants, and he was heavier than I was. And he shoved me out into the aisle and shoved me stumbling up that aisle. I was trying to turn around to get him to kill him so I could get out of that crazy place. And he pushed me stumbling up over the steps and into that room. And three or four other sinners got in that room there with me too. And Chaplain Payne came running in. And he got hold of my hand and began shaking it very vigorously. And he said, I'm so glad you've given your heart to the Lord. And I said, what the world are you talking about, giving my heart to the Lord? I didn't give it to anybody. Well, when we left there, that, that room, I was so angry with Gilbert Henry, I was just waiting to get him outside so I could actually kill him. Well, he was so elated with my conversion that I couldn't hit him. He was just too happy. And I couldn't hit a fellow that, that thrilled and happy. Well, when we got back to the barracks, within 15 minutes, he was terribly discouraged because I hadn't been converted. Well, do you know that the next Saturday night he was right back at my side again? And he said, you've got to come and hear Chaplain Payne again. I'm not going near that idiot. He said, you've got to come and hear what he says next week. And I got angry with him again after what he had done to me. And then this pressure again. And again, I gave him the fist. And I said, if you don't shut up, I'm just going to really smash your one. He said, I'll shut up if you'll go with me. I'll go with you. I said, just to keep you quiet. Well, I was stuck again without knowing what I had said, but again, my word was my bond, and lo and behold, on Sunday at 7.15, he was right there at my bunk claiming my promise. So back we went to hear Chaplain Payne. We sat about in the same place. He ran onto the platform, and he preached a sermon ten times hotter. And he had everybody stand up again. The same call was made, and that crazy Gilbert Henry got me by the back of my pants, and he shoved me out there again, and stumbling up the steps and into the room, and the second time, Chaplain Payne came through, shaking my hand, along with those other sinners that got in there with me, and saying how delighted he was that we had given our hearts to the Lord. Again, the elation of Gilbert made it impossible for me to hit him. But I was worried when I went back to the barracks. He scared me about that boiling oil down there where hell was located. That's the first time I ever heard of that place. 
The second time I'd ever heard of that place, hell I thought was just a, a cursing word, not a literal place as it were. And I was afraid when I got to my bunk. And I said, I better make some kind of a choice. I don't want to go down there and burn. That hurts. At least it wouldn't hurt sitting on the edge of a cloud playing a harp. But I don't want to do that either. And I had a little bit of a tussle in my heart. And when he came on uh, Sunday evening, the third week, I said, I'll go with you before he could say anything. Well, Chaplain Payne preached the same kind of a sermon the third week. And when he made the call, I beat Gilbert Henry to the jump and I was out on the aisle. And I voluntarily went into the room. Now, three times in a row looking at me, Chaplain Payne stopped. And he said, I'm so glad you've given your heart to the Lord again. It's time for you to be baptized. I said, what's that? Oh, he said, we'll take you to the church in Lincoln. This is the city church. And we'll put you in a big tank of water. And I'll put you under the water and you will die. <laughs> die? <laughs> yes, yeah, he said, you will die. The old man will die. And I'll raise you up out of the water and you'll be a new creation. He said, no, you don't, chaplain. You're not going to play that hocus pocus with me. I might get down there by accident and you're not going to... You're not going to baptize me. And I ran out of the church and never went back again. Wouldn't you know that that's the way the devil would introduce someone to the Lord? In as difficult, in as disordered, and ugly way as possible. So I fled away and never to return. Well, my training was over there and I went up to Boeing Aircraft. There I took my, uh, my uh, flight engineering on B-17s. And all crews had to take gunnery training, and I came down here to Arizona to Kingman. And there I took all of my ground gunnery, and then we were sent out to that wondrous place called Yucca. And Yucca then had four houses and a railroad track right, right in between them. It was a place of isolation, the backside of the desert. And while I was lying on my bunk, a wonderful young Baptist boy came by, and he handed me a book. And he said, Harris, why don't you read this? It's a terrific adventure story. But what is it? It's about a man who was a terrible sinner who became a saint. It was a storybook in the life of Charles Fuller, the one-time speaker of the old-fashioned revival hour. That's really no more. So I lay on my bunk and I roared through that book and I was really impressed. It was Sunday evening. And he had given me an invitation. Why don't you come over to the chapel tonight? And I said to myself, I'll never go in one of those crazy places again. But when I finished reading about that man who was changed, who was so much like me, I so much like him, that I decided I'd go. I just felt impressed. Go to the chapel. So I rolled off my bunk into a uniform and I started off to the chapel. Walking across the parade ground, which was an immense size, and halfway across... God spoke to me. Now, this is the only time I can recall in my life where the voice of God has come audibly. And when he spoke, it was like a clap of thunder and like lightning and like glory. And when God spoke, I stopped stunned in the middle of the parade ground and he simply said, I want you for a minister. And when I stopped at the sound of those words, I was immobilized, I was paralyzed with fright, and I turned and looked all around to see who had spoken. But there wasn't a soul within a half a mile of me. I was alone out under the desert sky. I want you for a minister. Well, when I recovered from it all, I quickly made my way to the chapel, and inside were five fellows. This was on a Wednesday night. Five fellows... We're down in the front row, and they were reading from Matthew. And they would read a verse and discuss it, read a verse and discuss it. And I sat behind them. And suddenly I felt a seething rage swelling up in my heart. You see, the devil was not about to let me go. A seething rage welling up, and suddenly I jumped to my feet and raced out of the chapel, never ever to return again to any chapel. Well, the training was over and we were sent down to Florida and the devil was right there again. 
In those days when a crew was made up, there were 10 lines, a line of pilots, co-pilots, navigators, bombardiers, engineers, radio operators, and then gunners, 10 lines. And the first man off of the front of each line, that made up a crew of 10. And I'll tell you, the Lord, the Lord tried, I'm sure, but the devil was present in the selection of our crew. What a motley, miserable crowd of 10 fellows. You've never seen the like of it. The pilot, he washed out flying fighter planes and they put him on a four-engine bomber. He couldn't run one engine, so he had four to run now. And what a crazy pilot he was. He couldn't fly worth anything. When we'd come in for landing, you never knew what was going to happen. Sometimes we'd hopscotch down the runway with giant 10 and 12 foot jumps. And the navigator, he was a washed out pilot, so they put him in a navigational school. And we never knew where the world we were with him. We went down to Cuba once and we couldn't find Florida again. We got it by accident, quite by accident. He put us into a bomb running in 180 degrees off one night. We flew into the formation in reverse. See? Here they were coming at us and we flew right into it, passing bombers above and below and all around us. We never really knew where the world we were with that fellow. The co-pilot, he was sharp, he was good. Four of the three, uh, three of the four gunners were washed out pilots also. So everybody was mad at the Air Force because they were washed out pilots and everything we did was crazy. One day we were flying on a training mission down there in Florida and an engine caught on fire. And uh, the thing was a fierce flame and it was so hot that the engine nacelle melted on the wing and hung down under the wing. Well, quick as a flash, half of the crew bailed out without even getting a bailout signal. Well, the fire was put out very quickly and the plane landed very safely, but they jumped out just for the kicks of jumping. You know, that was the kind of a crew we had. <laughs> when our training was finally finished, we picked up a new B-17 and uh, we were eager to go into war. I wanted to go into war and to fight and to kill. That's what I've been trained for. You know, even today, I must catch myself. The urge to kill can come so quickly when you're under pressure. It's a terrible thing to carry with you always. The instant response, as I say the urge to kill, it's actually the response, it's an instantaneous response. Instantly, when you've been trained to do it, you never forget it. So we picked up our new B-17 bomber and finished up our final phases of training, getting the plane ready to go, and we flew up the East Coast over to Newfoundland. And wonder of wonders, we found Ireland. We, we didn't find our base. We missed that completely. He had navigated us off down to Southern Ireland, and we finally made our way back up to Northern Ireland. We got there quite by accident, I'm sure. And when we landed, uh, there at the end of the runway was a Jeep with a big sign on it, follow me. So we obediently followed the Jeep around onto a taxi strip into a hard stand. The engines were shut down. A couple of officers jumped off the, off of the Jeep and uh, came on board and on the interphone system very sternly said, get your gear and get off. I said, man alive, get our gear and get off. We've brought this plane over to go into combat. Get your gear and off, he said again. So we obeyed and off came our gear. And in a few moments, the engines were turning again and the plane flew off to England. Now we're in Ireland without a plane. So the guessing began. The plane was being taken away to camouflage and getting ready for combat and all the rest of it. We'll get it again. We wanted to take that new aircraft, which was really a flying fortress into, into combat. After a week in Ireland, we were flown over to Scotland. No plane. Then down to Polebrook to the 509th Bomb Squadron. No plane. The first thing when we alive, arrived there, we wanted to know, where is our aircraft? Is it here? And the crew chief wouldn't answer us. He said, get in the Jeep and we'll take you out to your plane. So we went around the circular part of the field and on the, uh, on the roadway, and we started passing the aircraft. All the new aircraft were up in the front. I was looking for her serial number and she wasn't there with the new ones. And it was a terrible disappointment. Then we came to the, to the uh, aircraft that would be considered good quality, and we passed all of those, and then we came to the fair quality aircraft, and then we came down to the junkyard, and we came to the last hard stand. And we turned in, and there sat my princess. 
And as we rolled up to my princess, I looked at the name painted up there on her nose. And said, my princess, my foot, what a pile of junk. Well, you see, the thing was down there at the junkyard to be stripped of any usable parts. And that was the end of my princess. But as I stepped off the Jeep and began looking at that aircraft, I saw a kind of a crazy quilt pattern all over the wings and the fuselage. And as I stepped closer, I saw that these funny, crazy quilt-looking patterns were pieces of aluminum, circular pieces, square, rectangles, riveted into places where bullets had gone through her fuselage and wings and pieces of flak had torn their way through. And then I stepped back and looked up under the pilot's window and I started counting bombs. You see, every time an aircraft went on a raid and returned, a bomb was painted on the fuselage, indicating how many raids the aircraft had made. Normally, an aircraft and a crew are expected to make eight to ten raids. Then you'd be dead, the aircraft gone. Our life expectancy was eight to ten raids, that's all. And I started counting bombs. Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, five, six. Forty-six bombs were painted on the fuselage under the pilot's window. And then I could understand why all of the flak. You see, she had gone four times beyond what she was supposed to do. As I climbed on board the aircraft through the waste compartment entrance, I saw very ancient equipment. This was one of the first models of the B-17. She had trained hundreds of crews. I suppose that plane must have had close to 50,000 hours of flight time, which was a great deal for those days. As I passed the machine guns, I could see where the the uh, abrasive materials on the floor that the gunner stood on, which would keep them from slipping, was all worn off. The shackles that held the, uh, the guns into place were worn terribly. I passed a ball, gun, uh, ball gunner's uh, turret, and as I looked down on the great 48-inch ring which held that gun turret in the aircraft with 48 bolts, one inch in diameter and six inches long, I saw that those bolts were all rusted solidly. And I said to myself, boy, if we ever have to try to drop this gun turret, when we lose power on our engines, we'll never do it. Little did I realize that that would come true. I stepped into the uh, radio operator's room and the seats were so worn that he sat on that the springs were sticking out through the upholstery and old ancient equipment in the banks there, radio gear. Then I stepped into the bomb bay. And as I stood on the catwalk, I looked at the bomb shackles. These were worn half in two. And I had been on aircraft many, many times with, uh, with shackles like that, and they would often get hung up. One shackle would release, one shackle would hold, and there was your bomb dangling, fully armed in the bomb bay. And at 30,000 feet, we'd have to get out on that catwalk and kick the bomb loose. And here was a plane with all shackles half-worn in two. She had dropped thousands of bombs. And that makes me think of our bombardier. I don't know how in the world, as a washed-out pilot, how he ever passed bombardier's training. He couldn't hit anything, except when he was fooling around. And we had an island that we bombed uh, off of the Florida coast as a target, but he would always pick banana boats to see how close he could drop a bomb and nearly blow them out of the water. And he, had a, he, he did it almost every, every practice mission we made. One day he dropped 18 bombs in Tampa Bay and blew all the windows out of those great mansions along that beautiful harbor. Well, I was thinking of him as I stood on that catwalk. Then I slipped up onto the flight deck and into the co-pilot's seat, picked up the charts, and to my dismay, I found that our aircraft was 550 hours beyond overhaul time, as the engine should have been pulled off for complete overhaul 550 hours previously. The crew chief came on board and as he stood next to my seat, I looked up into his face and I said, does this thing run? He said, well, yes, sir, it runs, but not very well. Well, a pilot came on board along with a co-pilot and we started up the engine. They sounded like hay balers. The clanking was terrible. We taxied our way down to the, to the uh, strip and revved the engines up to full power, which wasn't very much power, but it was all those engines could produce, released the brakes. And it took five 
thousand feet of 5,500 to get it in the air. Empty. And I wonder, what in the world are we going to do when we have this thing loaded with bombs and fuel? We flew it for about an hour and a half, and I thought it, frankly, was going to fall apart. But this was a very critical time of the war, and every plane had to fly, and so my princess was pressed back into service, and we came in as a replacement crew for somebody who was shot down a few days before. We flew my princess for about three weeks, and then one day the grapevine began leaking the message that the next day was to be a maximum effort air raid on the city of Berlin. That was the rumor. A maximum effort air raid was a very dangerous and critical thing. It meant that usually about a thousand Yankee planes and a thousand British planes would bomb one single target for 24 hours. The British would bomb all night and the Yanks would bomb all day. 24 hours nonstop. Now that was a rumor that it was going to be a maximum effort raid. And of course Berlin was guessed and Dresden was guest and Cologne was guest and all kinds of targets. And whenever that kind of an announcement came, everybody got really nervous. And my crew was no exception, so down to the PX we went. And we decided to drown our fears in drink. And so everybody got drunk there at the PX. And after we had been there for a few hours, we decided we'd go to a movie. And we had an old tent pitched in the woods next to our barracks. And we took in a couple of movies, and about 11 o'clock that evening we went back to the barracks, and as I opened the door in somewhat of an inebriated state, I saw a man standing next to my bunk, and he had all my uniforms laid out on the bunk. And he was in the process of putting on one of my shirts, and he was just putting his arm down the sleeve. When I saw him doing that, and I was instantaneously aflame with anger, and I ran down to him and I yelled at him, Hey, what are you doing? Putting on my shirt. And very nonchalantly and quietly, he turned to me. And he said, Fear not, Harris. You will never wear these clothes again. And with that, he put my shirt on my bed, turned away from me, and walked down three or four beds, and he was gone. I know it was an angel who had come to forewarn me that something was to happen and to make me think and to realize how feeble and how frail life really is. And I'll tell you, as I got into my sack, into my bed that night, I felt how fail, frail and feeble life was. I couldn't sleep. All I could hear were those words. You will never wear these clothes again. About three o'clock in the morning, the barracks chief came through blowing a whistle, ordering us out of our beds into our flight uniforms, down to the mess hall for breakfast, and then to the briefing room. And I'll tell you, young people, as we went into that briefing room, there wasn't any goofing around. There were no wisecracks, no jokes. There were 550 deadly serious young men. You know, most of us were between 18 and oh, 26 years of age. And as we sat in our seats waiting for the, in, for the briefing to begin, the 55 crews, 550 of us, just a few whispers here and there, that's all. And the intelligence officers came onto the platform and they said, gentlemen, you're on a maximum effort raid. The rumor was right. And it was just 550 groans because it meant a lot of us would not come back. A lot of us wouldn't come back. As the intelligence officers uh, continued their briefing, they told us with an electrifying result, gentlemen, we have informed the enemy that you are coming. It was a psychological maneuver on the part of the intelligence people, I guess. But you can imagine what it did to us. And he said, furthermore, gentlemen, the enemy has prepared for you. Your target is Berlin. And with that, of course, our flight map and everything was on the screen in front of us with a red line showing our base at Polbrook, running off across the North Sea through Holland, 
along the Baltic Sea past Schwenemundi and down through Satine and then down to Berlin. And when we saw Berlin, there were just 550 more groans again. The intelligence officer said that our intelligence informs us that the Nazis have moved 600 flak guns into the city. Now, 600 guns to defend a city like Berlin doesn't sound like very much. But mind you, these were 88 and 105 millimeter guns. Each of them could shoot two shells per minute, which meant that 1,200 shells every 60 seconds would be exploding down the flight path that each squadron would take. Because we'd come in one squadron after another and all those 600 guns would be concentrated right in on those 55 aircraft, 40 aircraft, 30 aircraft. Squadrons were of different sizes. And you can imagine what the devastation would be. That's why everybody was petrified with fear. Well, the briefing was over and we were on the trucks and we were headed out to our aircraft. And when our truck pulled up in front of my princess and I jumped off, I saw the tires were half flat. And I thought, good night, what kind of a load are we carrying? Well, I did my external inspection. We pulled the props through and I climbed on board through the waste compartment door and there piled up along the sides of the fuselage were boxes of ammunition. Lying on the floor were spare machine guns. These are the big 50 caliber machine gun. As I walked past a ball gun turret, here were more uh, boxes of ammunition piled up and I looked at those rusted bolts once again and I wondered, would this be the day? Into the radio room and another machine gun lying on the floor, a spare one, as well as one sticking out through the top. Boxes of ammunition piled against the radio equipment. And then onto the catwalk in the bomb bay, and I think my heart must have... It, the, the speed up was substantial without any doubt. There suspended in the bomb bay were eight huge 500-pound super high explosive bombs. These are eight feet long and about 18 inches in diameter. On top of these were two eight-foot-long canisters, each containing 100 phosphorus bombs. So we were carrying 208 bombs on board. Now, the phosphorus was of a very high quality, which could burn through several feet of concrete. Now, we were carrying a lethal load indeed, and as I slipped into the co-pilot seat, and picked up the charts to my dismay, I found we were carrying 3,000 gallons of fuel. No one of the tires were half flat. And as I started up the engines, it sounded to me like the rattle and the clanking from number three engine was worse than ever. And the crew chief came on board. And as he stood next to my seat, I looked up into his face and I saw concern written all over his face. And suddenly, by impulse, I guess, I reached into my pocket and I took out my wallet and I handed it to him. And then from another pocket, I took this watch, which I received when I graduated from high school. And I handed that to him. And I saw tears beginning to run down his cheeks. Do you know what I was telling him? It wasn't coming back. That's what I was saying. Without a word. I wasn't coming back. And with the tears pouring down over his hardened cheeks, he dropped down between the pilot, co-pilot seat through a hatchway into the navigator's compartment, then out through a, an escape hatch behind the props. And that was the last I saw of him. I felt a weird sense of uh, ill will among the crew and a sense of an omen of uh, ill things. The crew was on board. We received our uh, signal. Everything was by lights because the Nazis would be listening and they would know how many aircraft were taking off at any given time if it were by radio. They knew pretty well anyway from their own spies. They were all around the air bases. And we got our signal to move off of the hard stand. And with the engines cranked up at quite a substantial power, my princess began easing off of the hard stand. And as she moved, there was a high-pitched squeal coming out of the right strut, or wheel on the right strut. It was a high-pitched squeal that had a, a weird omen attached to it, too. And all the way down the, the taxi strip, this was the case. We got to the end of the runway, three aircraft at a time would take off, one right behind the other. 
We got our green light from the tower and with the throttles at war emergency power. Now this is a superpower that the engines produce for about 15 minutes and then the engines freeze. They get so hot the, the pistons just freeze in the cylinders. They seize. And of course that breaks the crank and everything flies all to pieces. And they're only good for about 15 minutes like that. So with superpower on we started inching our way from our way down the runway. It seemed like an eternity when those brakes were released before she started moving. She was just shuddering and shaking. And as she mushed her way down the runway, I took my place behind the pilot's seat. He was a pilot that never watched his instruments. I had to watch his instruments as the engineer and tell him what was happening across the panel. He would remove one earphone from his helmet and I would shout into his ear what he wanted to know. And at this moment, he wanted to know airspeed. So I started calling at 70. At 70, we were halfway down the runway. That's how slow we were going. And then I was calling 80, 90. Now, we're at takeoff speed at 90. 100. And he started pulling back on the wheel, and my princess was going up and down. So we were going down the runway like this. As he pulled back on the, on the wheel, she was just so heavily loaded, my princess could not take off. And when we reached a 5,000 foot level, he still, uh, he still hadn't uh, throttled back. We were still going at, well, we're up to 120 miles an hour now. Well, this had happened all the time, and I didn't know it with those aircraft. The engineers, or the ground engineers, built a six foot bump into the end of the runway. And we hit that thing going 120 miles an hour at the 500, at the 5,300 foot mark, and it threw us into the air, releasing the wheel friction, and we were airborne. Now, how'd you like to take off like that? <laughs> With 3,000 gallons of gasoline and 208 bombs on board. Well, we just nicked the top of some trees far off from the end of the runway, and we just mushed our way up. Oh, it was a terrible experience. We had some branches stuck on the wheels. <laughs> As we retract, uh, retracted the wheels, the branches were sticking out, the leaves were sticking out. And we pulled our way up through the clouds and then we began our rendezvous. Now put 55 planes into, a, into formation takes a lot of doing. It takes a little time and we went around and around and we got into the formation. And wouldn't you know, we ended up with my princess in tail end Charlie position. That's the last plane back in the formation and the lowest one down and if anybody ever gets shot down, it's tail end Charlie. And here we were with the oldest plane on the base and in the most crucial position. They put us there, of course, because the plane was so old and uh, unairworthy that we could drop out of the formation without spoiling it, I guess is the reason for it. And we were bound and determined we were going to stay in that formation. We were not going to abort. We were running at full power just to stay in the formation and those fellows were running at about, uh, oh, three quarters of, of power and they had to throttle back so that we could catch up with them, stay with them. We made our way across the, Baltic, across the uh, North Sea and into Holland, and there we saw our first fighter planes, hundreds of them in the sky. But for some strange reason, they didn't close to attack. We followed along by Lubeck on the Baltic. More fighter planes, hundreds of them again, but they didn't close. We followed all the way across on the shores of the Baltic to Schwinnemundi. That was the huge naval base, a gigantic thing, and hundreds of planes came up, and oddly again, they didn't attack our squadron, but they took the squadron ahead of us and the one behind, and we flew through without any attack. Then we turned southwest, headed for um, Berlin, coming over Stettin. And as I looked out ahead, about 150 miles, I could see the great, enormous, black cloud of smoke like an atomic blast over the top of the city. We were coming in at, the, um, at 11 o'clock in the morning, so the city had been bombed for 17 hours when we made our appearance. And the devastation was immense and catastrophic, and thus this great pile of smoke over the city. The bombs were armed when we were about 50 miles out. Everybody was in their positions for the attack that was sure to come because hundreds of fighter planes were up in the air taking the squadrons ahead of us and behind us. And as we came in closer and closer, we could see the individual puffs of smoke from the flak bursting. 
The 600 guns were doing their work. Planes were going down everywhere. And as we came into the, uh, to in about 25 miles of the target, the fighter planes were taking on the squadron in front of us with intensity. And they broke off. Instead of coming back to us, they went around the perimeter of the flak and picked that squadron up as they came out. Well, in just a few moments, we were into the flak, and the bursts of 88 and 105 millimeter shells were throwing us all over the sky. Now, our intention was to pack in as tightly as possible, with one wing almost into the fuselage of the plane next to you, so that we'd have concentrated bombing. Those 550 bomb canisters would go down in one cluster. The Friedrichstrasse station was our target, and the Gestapo headquarters. And as the bombs were released, in the midst of all of this tremendous flak, Tom Harmon, our ball gunner, turned his turret downward, and he watched this mass of 550 bombs, it was just like one solid block, going down, and he was describing to us what was happening as it went down. As, he, as we were flying over the bombs, you know, as you release them, they go at an angle, and so he was right on top of it, watching it with intensity and giving it all to us on our interphone system, and the bomb struck the target dead center. If you go to Berlin today, you can see what we did. The damage is still there. The Gestapo headquarters is no more. There's only a little brick wall about two feet high, tapering off for 30 feet to nothing, and that's all that was left of the place. It said that we probably killed about 2,500 people in that raid. I do not doubt it. As those bombs exploded, the phosphorus blast came with a big white explosion, then came the black blast of the very heavy explosives on the eight bombs that we were carrying, and plus all of those of the other 55, 454 planes. And it was just one great big pile of black and white smoke, and everything disappeared and disintegrated. And then Tom screamed as if he had been shot. And what he screamed told us the end had come. He simply screamed, first burst 600 feet. What it simply meant was that a radar-controlled flak unit of five guns had found tail in Charlie. We were throwing out bales of aluminum foil to throw the radar off as it trailed out behind us. These were long strips of aluminum foil. But the guns would trail back on the squadron to tail in Charlie and lock on, and that's what happened to us. And a second later, he screamed 400 feet, 200 feet, and then the first burst got us. In the sec next few seconds, we had eight direct hits. A couple in the nose, Three engines were blown out, one in the waste compartment, one in the radio room. And then miracle number one. One of the shells went through our left main wing tank, which still contained about 500 gallons of high octane, 100 octane fuel. It went right through the wing tank, 100 or 200 feet above us and exploded leaving a hole about eight or 10 inches in diameter through that wing tank and the 500 gallons of fuel began pouring out of the wing into the trailing edge of the wing and vaporizing over the two red hot exhaust pipes. Now by every law of physics, we should have exploded in midair. But by God's grace, now I know my princess flew on. Then the engines began going. Engine one, two, three went out. We had engine number four left. As we rode our way out of the flak, the rest of the squadron flew right off and left us. That is, whatever was left of the squadron did. And there we were over the middle of the city of Berlin with one engine. The oxygen supply was completely cut off at the back of the aircraft. And as I wrestled my way down underneath the flight deck and grabbed hold of a canister of, of uh, oxygen that had not been pierced by the flak, I carried it back to the uh, rear of the plane with an emergency mask on. The men were dying in the back of the plane. Fortunately, they were brought back to consciousness again with the oxygen. And we began a very steep dive down to about 20,000 feet where we could start breathing again. You can't breathe well at 20,000, but you can survive. And then miracle number two occurred. I began firing red flares out of the uh, flight deck for fighter assistance. And one P-38 came to our assistance. And as he made his way around our aircraft, giving us a visual inspection from his radio, came the words, I don't know how you fellows are staying in the air. You look like a kitchen sieve. The plane was just blown full of holes, just shattered to bits. 
Everything was knocked out on it. The radio equipment, everything was gone. Navigational equipment, we were completely lost with any aid, so we needed the P-38. But miracle number two happened now. Hundreds of fighter planes were waiting for us as we came out of the flak, but not a single one closed to attack. And do you know why? The day before, Hermann Goring, the Nazi air chief, issued an order that no fighter plane was to attack any bomber flying by itself that was crippled. Can you imagine that, the day before that order came? Why did it come? Well, because they were losing so many fighter planes attacking crippled bombers along the coast. We were getting such terrific fighter coverage. Nazis were losing too many fighter craft. So they elected not to attack any bomber that was already half blown to pieces because it wouldn't be usable again, probably anyway. So that order came, saving our lives a hundred times over the day before. You think it was a miracle? Boy, I do. We made our way dropping down to about 9,000 feet clear to the Dutch border, and we were arguing whether we should try to make a right turn and head for Sweden because we knew we'd never get back to England. But to make that right turn would take power we didn't have, and we'd probably go down in the Baltic Sea. Or should we go straight ahead and go down in the North Sea and hope that the English would get to us with their patrol boats before the Nazis got to us out of Holland and Denmark? And while we were arguing back and forth what to do, we ran over another flak gun emplacement. Five guns again started shooting at us. And as the shells pumped up into my princess, the pilot lost control of the ship. We started over into a power dive, and we bailed out. Now, this is the first time I had ever bailed out. All I had ever had was an hour's instruction of what to do if you bail out. And to make matters worse, I had one of those miserable creations of the British, an overwater parachute. One of the most dangerous things ever made. You have a six inch strap between your legs, two over the shoulders, and a quick release mechanism on your chest. And you could actually wait with this parachute until your feet went into the water. Hit the quick release mechanism and the whole harness would fly off of you. And you'd go down into the water free of the shroud lines and of the silk. You could inflate your Mae West, which was a life jacket. You could pop to the surface and you'd be free of all of that. Now, the standard parachute has a couple of straps between your legs. And uh, they're more difficult to get out of than this quick release mechanism system. And here I had that miserable thing, the most dangerous chute in the world. That strap between your legs, if you had only a half an inch of slack in it when you jumped and opened your chute, could split you into the lower abdominal section. A couple of inches could take you into the upper abdominal section. And anything beyond that could actually split you clear up to the collarbone. I had six inches of slack. And the slack was there because of crawling underneath the flight deck to get the can oxygen canister. And I forgot to cinch the thing up. Well, now they told us in the parachute uh, classes that when you jump out, while there's nothing to it, you just jump out and you go down feet first and it's just beautiful sailing down. You can put your arm and leg out and go around that way and around that way and, <laughs> and there's nothing to it. Well, I'll tell you, when I stepped up to the door to jump out, everything went wrong. When I jumped out, the slipstream vacuum had me, pulled me out and I was in a very tight spin going a thousand per, I think. And I was sick in just a few moments of that very tight spin. And I remember, put your arm and leg out. So I put my arm and leg out, and I was in cartwheels from here downtown. I was <laughs> sick in reverse again. Oh, it was a terrible thing. And I ended up going towards the earth head first, which is the wrong way to go to open the parachute. But it was miracle number three. You know, I tried to get out of that head first trajectory trajectory, which was at an angle like this towards the ground, and I couldn't move. I put my arm and leg out and I couldn't move. God had locked me into that position to save my life. And when I looked over my shoulder and saw the ground coming up fast, I thought it was just a few feet away from it. It was actually many thousands of feet. I pulled my ripcord and the parachute blasted out over my feet and my shoulders took the blow instead, saving my life. It only cracked one vertebrae. So that wasn't so bad. But as, I, as that parachute blasted over my feet and the riser cords yanked out to their full length, my shoulders, or the harness, acted as a hinge. And so I was flipped around the other way and went up in the air feet first, looking into the parachute down here and then back around the other way and over there. Oh boy, I was sick in the third direction now. 
As I drifted down towards the ground, I found myself going backwards, which is the wrong way to land. <laughs> but God was working miracle number four, unbeknownst to me. Now, you can turn your parachute around by crossing your, your uh, harness straps, your riser cords, and letting them go, and that will turn the parachute around. But I didn't have any strength to even budge them. That tremendous blow sapped all of my strength. I didn't know that that could happen. A heavy blow will take your strength. In fact, that blow was so terrific, it pulled one of my flying boots off. It was a zippered boot over an electric shoe and an electric uniform to my knees so tight that it took one man to pull them off. And yet it snapped it right off of my foot. That's how savage the blow was. And as I drifted down towards the ground, we were getting ready now for miracle number four. As I looked down, I was uh, into the fields. We saw farmers working in the cabbage fields, and they were hoeing the weeds. And just below me, about a thousand feet, was one of my crewmen, uh, a gunner named Levy Pratt. Pratt was headed for one of those cabbage patches. And the farmers were working there in a great big circle, and they didn't know he was coming, and he didn't announce his coming. Whether you who look out here, I come or anything. But some of the Land Watcher army members saw us coming. These are the old men, too old for military service, but good enough for the home guard type of service. And they started shooting at us. And the bullets went sailing past us and go through the parachute, and you'd hear the pop and then the sizzle of air going through the hole. And shooting like mad at us, poor Pratt was coming right down into the middle of all these people who didn't realize he was coming. And he landed in the middle of them and he scared the wits out of them. They thought the paratroopers were coming, I guess, and they threw their hose in the air and ran out of the field. But a few moments later, they came back and very nearly killed him. And I turned my attention to see where I was landing with the bullets zinging past. Fortunately, with a fall and the drift, we were a hard target. And wouldn't you know that I was headed for the biggest tree in Germany? A big walnut tree. And I tried pulling down on one of the riser cords to collapse the chute to drift away. And the harder I struggled, the more I went right into the center of the tree, it looked like. And sure enough, I hit the tree going backwards, which saved the more tender parts, the face and the abdomen. And I struck it with the heavier uh, parts of my uniform and the flying... Uh, the electrically heated suit, which is a tremendously heavy thing, fell through the branches without straddling any of them again, fortunately, and the parachute blossomed out over the top of the tree. The branches gave way as my weight uh, took its toll on the tree, and I fell out through the bottom of it, and so it snapped up into a horizontal position and then dropped 12 feet to the ground on my back. As the branches went back to their normal position, I was dragged across the ground and smashed against the trunk of the tree, paralyzed from the waist down. I was stunned from the blow on the head as well, and I lay against the trunk of the tree. I don't know how long I lay there, but I couldn't move my legs at all, and after a long while I felt piercing pain shooting down my right leg. And I found I could move my foot just a bit, and then the pain started shooting down the left leg, and I could move my foot a bit again there. After a long while, I hit that quick release mechanism. The harness fell off and I got hold of the riser cords and pulled myself up into a standing position, only able to shuffle my feet a few inches. And I started stumbling off across the field in the direction that I thought Pratt had come down, not knowing what had happened to him. And I got out into the field just a few yards and I heard a voice shouting, Comrade, comrade, come and see here. And I turned around painfully and standing under the tree were three men dressed in civilian clothing. And they were shouting, comrade or friend, come, come here, come and see here. And I shuffled my way back to them. And the one who stood in the center, he said, comrade, hab and see, and he made the sign of a gun. And I didn't understand him. And he said, uh, Dutchman, Frenchman, Ruski, or Russian. And I, even in my day's condition, I knew you wouldn't find a Dutchman, Frenchman, and a Russian running loose in Germany when they were all enemies of those people. They surely wouldn't be the underground, not that kind of a trio. And he kept asking, Habensee, Habensee, making a gun. Do you have a gun? And when I understood and said no, then smash came his fist into the face. 
and the beating followed with a club, a uh, leaded club. My hand, with my left hand, was smashed. They jerked me around and dragged me down the, the little country lane, and there was Pratt standing in an intersection. The blood was gushing out of his mouth. He was cut and bruised terrifically. And as soon as I arrived, they decided to execute us. Then one said, we cannot execute him without the burgermeister or the mayor of the village from whence they came. And so a runner was sent off to the village to get the burgermeister to come to take charge of the execution, and the whole village came. Instead of taking us to the village to execute us, it was to be done in the country because in the village there was a contingent of soldiers, and they would take us as prisoners of war. The civilians could not do that and kill us with the soldiers present, so the whole village came. And when the Burgermeister came, he was very much a Burgermeister, a big rotund fellow, and he took his place and he, they began cursing us, calling us pig dogs, Schreinhund, gangster type, and Chicago gangsters, and everything else. And you can understand that the people would speak like that because their country had been devastated. They had no part in the war. They were all old people living on their farms and they didn't know what was happening. With their own uh, government even out in that isolation where they were, so one could not blame them for reacting as they did. And the Burgermeister selected the ten leading citizens of the village to shoot us. Five for each of us. And he had a terrible time selecting the ten leading citizens for the honor. When he got them selected and the guns were handed to them, they lined up in a long row. In a row, I guess, about as wide as the center pews here. Pratt and I were pushed off about uh, 30 feet from them. Pratt was so wounded he could hardly stand. I was in such terrific pain, hardly able to move my legs, that we had to hold each other to stand. And with all of the people shouting and screaming, pig dogs, gangster type, and Pratt and I were waiting to die. And I'll tell you, young people, I didn't want to die. I was only 20 years old. I wanted desperately to live. I had no hope. I could think of Chaplain Payne's boiling cauldrons of oil down under the ground. And I was scared, and I didn't want to die. So the Burgermeister gave the commands. Ready? The guns came to the ready position. Aim. Five at my chest, and five at Pratt. And I'll tell you, my young, dear young people, I never, ever would want to face that kind of situation again without being a Christian. I have faced death several times in the mission field, but I had peace that I'd never want to face again without being a Christian, that firing squad. Ready? Aim? Fire! He screamed! he screamed and the guns triggers were all pulled and my miracle of miracles it's miracle number five the guns wouldn't fire but they'd been shooting at us just a little bit before as we came down in the parachutes and the burgermeister in frustration ordered the uh, guns to be cleared and recharged which was quickly done and again he gave the command ready aim fire miracle number six coming up triggers are pulled and the guns would not fire again once more he ordered the guns to be recharged and for the third time, ready, aim, fire, and for the third time, miracle number seven, the guns would not fire and just at that moment onto the scene came a half a dozen soldiers from the village that these people had come from. Uh, these were um, a detail of soldiers such as were in all of the villages keeping watch over citizens' activities. And it was these men that they did not want us to fall into the hands of because they would take us as prisoners of war well, they, these people had orders to kill every Air Force man they could catch. That was part of the bureaucracy uh, mess up in Berlin. That the Land Watcher Army had orders to kill. The military had orders to bring us in alive. And these half dozen soldiers came on the scene, following the people out of the city. Something was wrong, they knew, with everybody evacuating. And as they arrived on the scene, they tried to shoot us again. 
And the soldiers, of course, knocked the rifles down and got into a terrible battle with these civilians. Now, there were only half a dozen of them, and there were 300 civilians. And these soldiers took their rifles by the barrels and began swinging them around their heads and were knocking these old people all over the place. But there were so many of them that they just jumped on the soldiers and were knocking them down and sitting on them while they were trying to get lined up again to shoot us. And if they couldn't shoot us this time, of course, they would have run us through with bayonets, I'm sure, in their frustration. And they were just dragging down the last soldier when he fell upon his machine pistol. It's a machine gun-like weapon. And he swept the thing up, and whatever he shouted at the people, they shrank back in terror, leaping off of the soldiers on the ground and, and just racing back out into the, into the woods and fleeing down the roadway. He must have said something about he would kill them all to cause that kind of a retreat. And now we were in the hands of the soldiers. They surrounded us and they dragged us down the roadway into the little village. In the center of the village was a, a square block of park area with a tiny little gardener's shed in the center of it. And we were herded into the shed while all of these people, the 300 of them plus now many hundreds more, were gathered around on the perimeter of the park. And the soldiers forbade them to come one inch onto the park or they would shoot them. Now, we could look through the cracks of the building and we could see these surly civilians all around. And they were looking really angry and we expected at any moment that they would rush the garden shed and they would overpower the guards even with their machine guns and we'd be torn limb from limb for that had happened many, many times. And while we were looking through these cracks, I saw a wagon coming, driven by a farmer and on the wagon was a body wrapped up in a parachute. Now, this was obviously uh, one of our crew members. And incidentally, two others had been herded into the shed with us, so there were four, and now came the fifth one on the wagon, wrapped up in the parachute. And we were positive this was one of our men. The crowd of people opened up, and the wagon drove through and up onto the, uh, the grass and uh, came up around in front of the building. And just at that moment, a Hitler youth in his brown uniform uh, broke loose from the crowd at the curbside and raced across the the grass and leaped up onto the wagon and with a mighty kick of his jackboot he kicked the body off onto the ground and there were shrieks and screams of agony telling us that the man was still alive although his parachute was stained red with his blood. Now we carried inside of our flight uniforms over our hips two escape kits that were sewn into the electrically heated suit that was underneath the nylon jacket and pants that we wore. Uh, this was very heavy blanket-like material that the uh, kits were sewn into and the electric wires were all inside of this blanket. So when they patted this over, they went right over these kits. They were about four inches long and three inches wide and a half an inch thick. Inside we had uh, maps of Western Europe, a compass, a fish line and hook, concentrated chocolate, some concentrated vitamin tablets, a few million marks of German and Dutch money. These were things that you could use to escape with if you were able to evade uh, the enemy. Thus, they were called an escape kit. Inside the kit, we also had a half dozen sterets of morphine. And these were about a half an inch long in a, in a uh, plastic tube. And you could just break the tip off and inject yourself and uh, inject the... Uh, morphine into you, and if you were wounded, this of course would be a very major factor in whether you were going to remain free or not. If your wounds were of such a nature that you were, you were, you were caused to cry out, this would reveal your position if you were hiding in a barn or in a haystack or wherever it might be. We tore these out of Pratt's uniform, and we had a dozen sterets in our hand, and we knocked on the door. And the burly guard opened the door and he said, Ja, was haben Sie? Real cross-like, almost screaming at us, What do you want? And we showed him one of the uh, sterets of morphine and made the motions of an injection. And surprisingly, he said, Ja, gut, come. Yes, good, come. And he led us out to the, to the body wrapped in a parachute. And as we started pulling back bloody flap after bloody flap of the parachute, down to the bottom was revealed the body of Herman Biddle. Now, Biddle was one of these fellows who would never, ever obey. If he was given an order, you could just guarantee yourself he'd be 180 degrees out of joint with it. 
On that morning of our fatal flight, we were ordered not to carry our uh, 45 automatic pistols. These are a special military pistol that we carried in a holster underneath our left arm. The holster was slung all around our shoulders, and so it was, it was hidden underneath your arm and the bulk of your, of your flight uniform. I don't know why that order was given. I suppose uh, we'd all have been killed if we had been carrying them. I'm sure I would have, because the first thing I would have done was to pull the thing out and start shooting when those three men captured me. And I would have been dead without any doubt. Biddle carried his gun because he was ordered not to. And he pulled it out when he got on the ground and he started shooting. And in turn was shot with a large caliber gun, leaving a hole about an inch in diameter just below the rib cage, just below his heart, which exited on the backside and just blew his back to pieces. And his left arm had been shot completely off except for a little piece of tissue holding it on. And you could see the bone jagged and crushed sticking out of the flesh. The blood was spurting with each beat of his heart through the, the artery and uh, the fellow had turned a yellow color. He had lost so much blood. In fact, it was a downright miracle that that man was alive. Well, we didn't have any instructions in our escape kits of how much morphine to give. And poor Biddle was writhing on the ground in a semi-conscious uh, state, uh, just in horrible agony. We didn't know how much to give him, so we gave him all of it, which knocked him out in just a few moments. And it's wonder it didn't kill him, of course. And then we tore a piece of his shirt and bound it around the stump of his arm to stop the flow of blood. You know, a miracle of miracles, that man survived. He was taken away to a military hospital and they cut the little bit of tissue that was holding his, his arm to his body and threw his arm away, of course, and then cut the arm off up at the shoulder. And he was repatriated three months later for two physically fit German soldiers that could return to the line. The rate of exchange was one crippled American for two physically fit soldiers that could return to the line. After a little while, a, a bus came along, a military bus, and uh, I could hardly move. The paralysis was still very evident. I could only shuffle my feet a few inches. I could hardly lift a, a leg even. And we were ordered to pull the body of Biddle onto the bus. Now, Tom Kaveen, our tail gunner, he had his right arm nearly sliced off with a piece of flak. It was clear down to the bone, and he was hanging onto his arm trying to stem the flow of blood and hold the thing together. And with that wounded arm, he reached out and got a hold of a pants leg of Biddle. Uh, Harmon got a hold of the other leg, and I tried to pick his head up just a bit, but I was not able to even bend down, except with terrific pain. And we dragged him up over the steps of the bus and down the aisle and put him on the back seat. Then we went down the highway just a little ways, and there we found another crew member. Uh, Tom was... Uh, a fellow that was 22, but he looked like he was 16. And uh, true to the German traditions of loving young people, the farmer who captured him thought he was just a youth, and the poor thing had been forced into the Air Force by the gangsters back in America. And so he took pity on him and took him into the farmhouse and gave him milk and bread and jam while he nearly killed the rest of us out there because we looked older. And we were taken to a military camp and held there overnight, and I won't tell you what occurred there. Then we were transferred to a train and taken to Emden to the naval uh, base and there we were thrown into solitary confinement and held for several days on a starvation diet. And I'll tell you, it was really a contrast to what we had been eating in England. We had the very best food that was available to the services and now we were eating rotten potatoes and that's all we had. We were locked in these uh, very confining solitary cells held there for several days, and then we were put on the train and taken to Frankfurt to the Dulag Luft, which was the interrogation center and the most dreaded place one could go to. Something interesting happened on the way down to the Dulag Luft. I had a guard assigned to me that was about 45 years of age. I was 20. And uh, I noticed that he wanted to speak to me, but he dared not speak with the other guards present in, present in the little compartment where we were held there were three prisoners and three guards and when the other two fellows were taken out to the bathroom we were left alone and he quickly leaned forward and he said I hate the war I lost my family and my home in World War I now have I lost them again in World War II I want the war to end 
And the way to end the war is to take Hitler and Mussolini and Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt and do this with their heads and then we will have peace. <laughs> now that was a very expressive comment. He was really saying what most of the German people were feeling. They wanted the war to end. They did not want the war, but were victims of it. When we arrived in uh, Frankfurt at the railway station, the thing was completely blown to pieces. The roof of the rail station is all of glass and steel frames. And of course, the horrendous bombing of Frankfurt was uh, just devastated the city. This was the favorite target, I think, of the British Air Force. They dropped the 1,000-pound blockbuster bombs on that city. And that's exactly what they were, blockbusters. Since Frankfurt is made of brick, when one of those 1,000-pound bombs would explode, uh, the brick would act as missiles and would go ahead of the blast and blow other buildings down. So great square blocks of the city were just nothing but rubble heaped together by bulldozers. And as we got off on the last of the tracks and walked through the fabulous building which makes up that, that rail station, our guards were on either side with machine guns and forcing the people to the side and we were taken out into the front of the building and the chief guard attempted to put us on a streetcar to take us through the city to another rail station which would then in turn take us out to the Dulag Luft. And the conductor refused to let any pig dogs on his train, on his streetcar. And he began screaming out, gangster type and Schweinhund, Americaner gangster type and and of course that attracted the attention of the people and the guards had to surround us with their machine guns pointing out in order to break out of the circle of people that were now throwing stones at us and cursing and we had to walk through the city rather than taking the, the streetcar to our rail station. As we were going through the city, I saw those great heaps of rubble. The people walking in a dazed condition up and down the streets, not even aware that we were passing through. Until one of the more alert ones saw us and screamed out, Americana Luft, Americana Luft, American Air Force. And as soon as she said those words, it was as if magic struck the people and they came whirling in on us with bricks and stones they began hurling them at us, and I'll tell you, when those bricks hit, they hurt like everything. We were, I, we were, all of us were wounded, and I was filled with piercing pain in the back and the legs, and yet forced to march through this, through this city, this long distance. And then it happened. One of those poor souls, screaming gangster type and schweinhund, or pig dog, raced up to me and coughed up a mouthful of phlegm and saliva and spewed it into my face and ran down over my uniform to the ground. Oh, I thank God that it happened now. And even when it did happen, I didn't hate her. You see how close God is to us when we don't even know it? When we're far away from him, young people, and we don't want him, he's right there. God is always on time. You know, he may not be there when we want him, or he may not come when we want him for some specific situation, but he's always there on time. And he was with me, though I didn't know it. And I thank God there was no hate. There should have been. You know, in all my heathenism, why shouldn't there have been, except God was present? Well, we finally made our way through that city, onto the train, and we were taken the five miles out to the Dulag Luft to begin a time of terror. As soon as we were taken into the prison, we were photographed and fingerprinted. We received our new dog tags and immediately we were hurled into solitary confinement in very special cells, constructed so that you would break down psychologically very, very rapidly. The cells are only five feet wide and seven feet long. No windows. Uh, everything was painted gray. No contrasting colors. Now, when you are surrounded with gray and there is no contrast, it's exceedingly depressing. You know, this thing was all engineered very cleverly by their psychiatrists, who were specialists in breakdown. Our bed was seven feet long, so that took the full length of the room. It was about two and a half feet wide, so that gave you two and a half feet of space between the bed and the wall that you could move in. There was a little stool to sit upon, and that was all of the furnishings. 
The mattress was one half inch thick. It was just a gunny sack. Uh, the full length of the bed that was filled with Excelsior and compressed down to only a half an inch thick. And there were five five inch wide slats crosswise on the bed, which meant that about every 18 inches there was a slat with a gap and a half inch mattress which hung in between. And you were forced to sleep on the bed. You could not sleep on the floor. The guards were always looking through the peak hole in the door, watching everything that was going on inside. The light burned uh, 24 hours a day. You never knew when it was day or night because you couldn't see outside. And in my physical condition, to sleep on that bed was just almost impossible. You push the slats together to give your back the support that it would need with that type of wound and the guard to be in making you spread the boards out again. Worse than all of that, you were permitted to go to the toilet or to the bathroom once every 12 hours. Now, if you made a mess in your room, you'd never, ever do it again because you were almost killed for it. And you'd clean it up with your bare hands. Now, I don't know if that would torture you or not. But it broke some men. But that was only the beginning. We ate uh, twice a day. You know, three times a day, I guess you could say. In the morning, we got two ounces of peppermint tea. At noontime, we got four ounces of sour barley. The barley was boiled in big vats and uh, allowed to sour, then it was reheated again. And so we got the four ounces at noontime. In the evening, we got another two ounces of peppermint tea, along with a piece of bread that was 50% sawdust and about an eighth of an inch thick and two inches square, about the size of a cracker, which was as hard as concrete. The fellows broke their teeth on it. You could put it in your tea and it wouldn't even absorb it. Now that was our food for the while that we, for the time that we were in the in the interrogation center. But that was only the beginning. They had very special ways in order to crack you. And one of the favorite ways was to drag you out of your cell about 4 a.m. There was a firing squad very obviously in the hallway. And you were jerked out of your cell and you were taken out of the prison, marched about four miles out into the woods, and there was a cemetery. It was an obvious cemetery because the mounds of dirt would indicate this, row after row after row. And the officer would, uh, with his stick, would make a mark on the ground six feet long and three feet wide. And you were handed a shovel and you were told to dig. You knew what you were digging. You were digging your grave. And it would take you all day to dig the grave. You had nothing to eat, nothing to drink. It was sandy soil, thus easy to dig in. But I'll tell you, you would take as long as you possibly could because you wanted every minute of life. Now, I've only known one person in my lifetime who really wanted to die. One filled with cancer, tortured, suffering so terribly. It's the only person I've ever known that did not want to cling on to life. And I'll tell you, we did. So you take all day to dig that grave. When you got down to six feet, then you'd start shearing off the walls and squaring up the corners and flattening out the bottom just to gain more time. And when it was obvious you could do nothing more, then you were pulled up out of the hole on the end of your shovel. Your heels were placed at the edge of the pit. The firing squad was lined up. The command was given, ready, aim. And the officer would say, tell me what I want to know or that's your grave. Now, what would you do? Now, would you tell him what he wanted to know or would you uh, give him your name, rank, and serial number like you're supposed to? You know, my only reaction to that kind of thing was to spit in his face and curse him and tell him to get in the hole himself. <laughs> yeah. But fellows cracked right and left under that kind of pressure. And they would tell everything. You know, the, and they would just let the pressure build for so many days until you couldn't take it anymore. And then they'd give you that kind of treatment. And if that didn't work, you might be hauled out of your cell after that exhausting experience of digging your grave. A couple of hours later, and you were taken to a very special room. And there you were strapped into a chair made of crude tubifores. Your hands were strapped to the arms with your fingers sticking over the edge, just about like this. And onto your fingers were placed rings on both hands with electrodes running away from them into a control panel. And the officer would simply say, you tell me what I want to know or we will turn on the electricity. Now, what would you do? Tell him or take the juice? 
I tell you, when that's, when that's turned on, you just swell against the straps and unconscious. You collapse in a semi-conscious state. And they revive you and do it again and again and again and again. And it was used very widely in the Vietnam War. You know, these kind of things have been around for a long time. Man's inhumanity to man didn't begin then. It's been around ever since sin entered this world. And it was used very widely in Vietnamese prisons. I've, been, I've seen them. I've seen them in the prison. Used every kind of torture imaginable. And if that didn't work, you were hauled out of your cell again, maybe just a couple of hours later, maybe three or four days later, after you thought it all over and recovered just a bit, so you were somewhat sane again. Into another room, same kind of a crude chair. This time your hands were tied down so only the fingertips were extended. And under your fingernails would come the hot needles, jammed under with a pair of pliers. Now I tell you, I can't stand anything under my fingernails. The whole world stops until I get it out. It's a terrible torture. And you mean to tell me you want to stay in a world like this? With that kind of thing going on, brothers and sisters, that we haven't even a notion of? It's all over the world. Man's inhumanity to man practiced in such beastly ways that we can't even fathom them. I want to get out of this place as quick as I can, don't you? Now, I'm trying to work myself out of a job just as quick as I can. I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ come. And if that didn't work, you were taken to another room. And there your head was tied back in the chair. And into your nostrils were thrust uh, plastic tubes. These in turn were attached to a high pressure uh, pump filled with ice water. And that was injected under high pressure into your nostrils. And oh mercy, as it, as it explodes into your sinuses and into your nasal passages, your head feels as if it is to split. And you begin drowning. You can't swallow fast enough. And if that doesn't work, then there's one more place that I won't even tell you about. My interrogation finally ended before the colonel. He knew everything about me. Do you know that they had spies all over this country that were clipping all of the information from every school that the people were graduating from? Every time a pilot graduated, some little note by the PR office was sent back to the hometown paper, and these fellows were clipping all of this stuff out. And they had pictures of nearly every one of us taken from our own newspapers. And you know, when they confront you with all that information, well, I know all about you anyway, why don't you just tell me what I want to know? And you know what they wanted to know from me? How a gasoline valve worked in the wing tanks. They wanted to know if it was hydraulic, electric, or mechanical. That's all they wanted to know. Just tell me, and we won't, we won't bother you anymore. We'll let you go to a prison, and you'll be treated well. Just tell me if it's hydraulic, electric, or mechanical. And how does it work inside? You know, what they wanted to know was uh, where the control points were so that they could aim their machine guns from the fighter aircraft at that vital point and destroy the uh, wing tank uh, mechanisms so that you would not have the long range that permits you to fly for 15 hours nonstop. And mine ended before the colonel with a man with a bayonet who tried to pin me against the wall, chase me around the room. I tell you, I never knew I could move so fast even when I was crippled and paralyzed. As he tried to jam that bayonet through me and attach me to the wall, thank God it was finally ended. We were herded together, those of us that survived the interrogations, most of us did, placed on a freight train, and we were taken across Germany way up into old Prussia on the Baltic Sea, a part of now of Poland. And there we were put in Stalag Luft III, IV. This prison was uh, designed to hold a few men, but we ended up with 10,000, which meant that we were jammed into barracks, 26 men to a room. And it was a beginning of months and months of hellish nightmare with a little to eat and freezing cold for it was now winter time. And for the first three months we ate uh, cabbage, nothing but cabbage, twice a day we would have our food and you'd get about uh, six ounces of cabbage at noontime and six ounces in the evening. And when that supply thankfully gave out, we turned to potatoes for three months. 
And we had potatoes with the jackets on and the jackets off. And mashed and boiled and cut up this way and cut up that way. And every way you could fix a potato to make it look different so you could eat it. And that supply thankfully gave out and then we turned to cow peas. And these cow peas were filled with big worms. And the things were about three and four inches long that were eating the, the uh, vital parts of the pea. And they, of course, wouldn't, didn't care anything about worms, so the whole bag full of beans would go into the, into the pot to be boiled. And uh, every time food changed, we'd always think about steak and eggs and bacon and all of that sort of thing as being the next time around. That's, that's exactly what it would be, but it always turned out to be something worse. And we could smell this awful odor coming from the kitchen. And we knew that there was a change of food for sure. The, the potatoes were gone now, and we, everybody was waiting to see what the world it was going to be. Now, here's, a, here's how we ate. Each room had a couple of galvanized buckets for 26 men. These buckets were taken by a fellow from the group up to the kitchen, to the mess hall. They were filled up with big uh, ladles. It was brought back to the room and 26 bowls would be lined up and everybody got exactly the same amount then you could eat well when the cow peas came in it smelled like swill and oh boy it was just really rotten everybody was trying to guess what the world was in the thing and when we got our spoons into that stuff and up came these worms boy you know that was almost more than you could take but then we made a joke out of it right away so the joke was to see who could get the most worms so we'd count them off by fives and and it was not uncommon to get 20 to 30 worms in a bowl of soup, but it was only a few days until we were eating the worms, too. When you're starving to death, you'll eat anything. Rats, mice, anything you get your hands on, you will eat. That supply gave out, and we turned to, to kohlrabis, which is like a turnip. Oh, boy, those things are so hard and pithy that it took an axe to break them. They had to actually hit them with an axe to split these great big things and chop them up small enough to get them in the containers into the... Uh, these cauldrons to boil the things up. That supply thankfully gave out and then we turned to sauerkraut that was spoiled. It had turned black. The military couldn't use it so they gave it to the prisoners and we liked to starve for the one week that we had that. Thankfully it was only one week. But then something worse came. They had nothing more to feed us and we turned to grass and weeds. The fields were mowed. The stuff was brought into the prison. It was boiled. That's all we had to eat. And I suppose that that probably, that one thing of eating grass and weeds changed the prisoners more than anything else physically. Blood chemistry change came. And allergies are a very common problem with prisoners. I can only eat 11 foods now without reaction. Thank you, Lord, for 11. Yeah, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, the days passed, and I can't tell you all that happened. Our time is not going to permit that. I want to tell you about trying to tunnel out of the place and how we drove Colonel Clink crazy and... Yeah, we, <laughs> we had a Colonel Clink there, and we had old Schultz, too. <laughs> Drove them absolutely nuts with tunnels, going every which way. Into our prison about in September came 2,500 men from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. As the Russians moved east, uh, westward and, and uh, south, these men were evacuated across the Baltic. They were put on barges. They were held on board for a week. Uh, down in the holds, they had no sanitary facilities. The food was just dumped down through the, the hatches into all of that filth. And you can imagine what kind of condition these men were in after being held for a week on that, on that barge. They arrived at, uh, at the port and they were placed on trains for another week, crammed in so tightly that you could hardly move. I know what it is like when they told us of this because I've ridden in exactly the same way, 80 men in a car, which meant that you had to stand there with your hands to your side and you were unable to move. You'd stay in the car for 24 hours at a time before you could get out. There were no sanitary facilities. You couldn't have used them anyway because you couldn't even move. And you were holding each other up. You talk about sardines in the cans. This was the kind of situation it was in the, in the rail cars. 
Men die. I tell you, it's a terrible experience to watch a man die next to you, screaming in agony as his appendix bursts. And you watch the death come, and his head falls upon you. And you ride like that for a day with a dead man standing next to you. You know, I want this world to end quickly. I want to get out of here just as quickly as I can. And to go to a place where that will never happen anymore. And these men arrived at our little village of Kifhaida. And as they came off of the, the trains, the guards met them with the dogs. These were savage Alsatians. They screwed inch-long steel fangs on the dogs and beat them with their rifles and turned them loose on the prisoners. And these 2,500 men had to run for their lives, throwing off their coats. They were so weakened that they couldn't wear that big GI overcoat, so they threw them into the ditches, and that's what the guards wanted because they could go onto the black market for fabulous prices, prices to make clothing from. They threw the little cardboard containers they were carrying it may have had a pair of socks or a pair of shorts or a t-shirt in. They threw those into the ditches and the guards wanted those. And these men ran with the bayonets thrust into them, the dogs leaping upon them, slashing at them. I watched. I'm not telling you something wasn't true. I saw it. And I watched them as they came into our prison. And I watched one lad as he came through the gate, staggering. His clothing had been cut off of him by the dogs. All he had on was his sweatshirt and his shoes. Everything else was torn off of him. And I saw the great gashes from his hips down to the tops of his shoes where those dogs with the inch-long steel fangs had leaped upon him and just slashed him down the legs. But worse than that, we counted 63 bayonet wounds in his back. 63 times he had been bayoneted. As he fell into our arms, we dragged him off. It took several of us to drag him away into the, into the little hospital that we had, which was nothing but a room. We had three doctors, but they had hardly any medications at all. And he lay on his stomach for three months. No suturing equipment even to close his wounds. Talking about hellish nightmares. They were with us always. I saw one man with black hair one day, and he was snow white the next. I don't know how chemistries like that take place. Overnight, he turned snow white. Men trying to climb over the fences, shot to death, hanging on the barbed wire. In the wintertime, we were herded into our barracks at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for the sun set about 3.30. We didn't get out until 9 o'clock the next morning. Twenty-six men jammed into one of those tiny little rooms. It was a hellish nightmare. And the breakdowns just came constantly. The men suffered agonies that are indescribable. Your attention span was so limited you couldn't even do anything. You know, we tried to start language classes and men would be in them for two or three days and just have to drop out. They couldn't concentrate. But we still beat them. In the summertime, we got a hold of Schultz and we, we decided we were going to play softball. At least those who were capable of playing decided they were going to do that. And we needed a, we needed a ball. And we bribed Schultz with some Red Cross cigarettes, a couple of packs of them, to bring a stone into the, into the prison. Just a round stone. And he, he understood, yeah, 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 he said, and he wanted those cigarettes, but you bring the stone before you get the cigarettes. And he took his life in his hands in doing that, and he brought the stone in, and that was the center of our ball. And somebody donated his, his knit sweater, and the thing was unraveled and wound around the ball, and somebody cut a piece of pants leg off and sewed that around this ball. It was a big flop-a-doodle thing. But it was a ball anyway. Now we needed the bat and we bribed Schultz again with two more packs of cigarettes to bring a tree limb in for us. And we described it to him about this long, this big around, tapering down to about that big. Yeah, yeah, he said he understood. And he went out into the woods and he cut a tree limb off and he put it in his pants leg. And he came goose stepping into the prison there with one leg going out. <laughs> no, dear, oh dear. The, I don't know how in the world he got past the guards out of the gate, except he was a sergeant and they were privates, so he got through there and he got his two packs of cigarettes and we had our bat. But to our dismay, when he pulled it out of his pants leg, the thing had a, a curve in it. And we started playing softball. You know, it was barracks against barracks, 
Good night. To get out there and hit that flop a doodle ball with a crooked bat, the thing would go off this way. But it was still, it was still a, still a run, you know. And uh, the guards would come by and they'd say, "Doom cough, doom cough," watching us play that game. But we beat them. You know that kept the crowd together. Those of us who couldn't play at all, we could get out there and laugh anyway. And when winter time came, we had the Olympics. And the only Olympics we could have, when snow was a foot or two on the ground, we'd pack the stuff down into a trench, making it about this wide, and maybe 50, 60 feet long. And the idea was to get back and run as fast as you could on the snow and ice and put on the brakes and slide down this channel. See who could slide the greatest distance. Well, we beat them with that too. It kept everything together in those long days of 18 hours in the building. But you know, at night, when they put the shutters over the windows, the blackout shutters, we could look through the cracks and we'd see those old ducks out there, the old guards, they were back there running and putting on the brakes and going down our same channels, which indicated they were very human, weren't they? Very human too. I think I'm going to stop there. The Russians came within 11 miles of the prison and we could feel the ground shaking with the mighty armament that was coming into Germany. The tanks were by the thousands and the thunder of their big uh, rifles. These were huge rifles on the, on the tanks and on the big trucks and trailers. They were gigantic things and they actually shook the ground 11 miles away and it was then that the order came to evacuate the prison. You see the high command in uh, Berlin believed that as long as they could hold prisoners the morale of the people would hold. Once they lost the prisoners the morale would collapse. It would be an indication that Everything had come to an end, or very near to it. And so they decided to evacuate us. And uh, they took out about 1,800 men by truck. These were men who were so sick that they could not stand up. If you could stand, you must walk. Well, I could stand, but I could hardly walk. But still, I must now go with those who would walk. So they broke us up into columns of 1,800 men. We moved out of the prison every other day until the prison was empty. This was in February of 1945. The snow and ice was upon the ground, the mud and slush, the rain, the hail, the sleet from off of the Baltic Sea was just stupendous. I've never been in weather like that except in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it was just absolutely fierce. All we wore were our summer uniforms with a jacket, an overcoat that came from the uh, Red Cross, two horsehair rag blankets, with a few possessions that we may have accumulated. Incidentally, cigarettes were the medium of exchange. You could buy food with cigarettes, and I have seen men sell a week's ration of food for a pack of cigarettes. Can you imagine that? So addicted. You know, when cigarettes were not available, we would get, we would get uh, the leaves from around the fence that blew in over the, over the top of the fence. We'd gather those together, and uh, we had we had uh, Russian prisoners who cleaned out our septic tanks. They used a special wagon I won't even name for you that came into the compound, and they would uh, pump all of the fecal material out of these big tanks, and um, then wash all of their tools off in our drinking water. And you can imagine we, we had no water to drink at all. We got a quart of water a week to wash with to bathe ourselves with and to drink one quart a week. A, I'll tell you, there's about 30, 40 minutes of things that happen I won't share with you that you'd find interesting, but which only compounded all of our problems. And these horses that pulled the wagons that cleaned out these septic tanks, you know, at the appropriate time, we get a handful of manure and dry it out and mix it up with these leaves that blew over the fence and we'd roll the stuff up in one of Hitler's propaganda papers and to make a big cigar about that long and that big around I'll tell you it was like smoking cannon fire <laughs> and that's what you do when you're addicted oh I thank God I was delivered from that I thank God I was delivered from that terrible addiction you know fellows we'd burn our lips we put the cigarette on a stick to smoke it down short enough to burn our lips. That's how addicted we were. Then save the two or three grains of tobacco in a box until we had enough to roll it in a piece of paper. Terrible. Well, we evacuated the prison and we headed out. And we were told we were going to march for three miles. The first day we marched 33 miles. We stopped only once in 33 miles. I'll tell you, you can do anything if you have to. My 
feet were made to go, one in front of the other. Every step was a giant pain. 33 miles of it the first day. The next day we were hardly even able to lift our heads from the ground. We were so stiff and sore we had to pull each other up from the ground. The next day another 30 miles. We crossed the Oder River, followed along the Baltic Sea, going up to Schwinnemundi and along clear over to Lübeck. The rain and the hail and the sleet and the mud, nothing to drink, and we got two potatoes a day to eat. Two potatoes about that size. That's all we had to eat per day. Occasionally we got a little slice of bread that was again 50% sawdust. We ate bread in Sinelli that was up to five years old. It had been taken out of the desert stores from Rommel down in Africa and brought back up into, the, into Germany. The paraffin was melted off of it. Of course, the bread began to mold, mold immediately and that was sent into the prisons. We ate green bread from crust to crust. That's all we had to eat. It took an axe to split some of the loaves uh, the stuff was as hard as all get out, and we ate a lot of mold, and I suppose that had its uh, effects upon us allergy-wise again. I'm allergic to every mold in the book. I don't know whether it came from that or not, but it's, the doctors claim that blood chemistry change was so catastrophic in my case that that's why I'm allergic to so much. days of walking past, instead of being uh, three days of walking as we were promised, it turned out to be 91. We walked until May 4 through the northern part of Germany. It averaged out about 10 miles a day, totaled up 750 kilometers. On that march, which was called the Great Black Death March in history, which you don't know very much about. For some reason, the government has chosen to keep that one rather secret. Called the Great Black Death March. We were, we were machine gunned by our own aircraft, taking us for German soldiers in retreat. We were starved to death. Men fell into the ditches, unable to walk. SS troopers came along, shot them to death, and left them in the ditches. Civilians were evacuated with us. Russian prisoners were evacuated in great, huge columns tortured and beaten before us, dying in the ditches. Men were dying like flies. I'll not tell you much more about what happened, except on one night we were herded into a barn and there were 250 of us left over that couldn't get in. The barns were about 10 miles apart. You see, the government owned all of the northern part of Germany and these great huge state farms 10 miles apart dotted, dotted across the, uh, the countryside. And so it was convenient to walk the 10 miles a day and then go into these huge barns where the prisoners were retained overnight and then they were sent on and then a, two days later would come the next group. Well, there were 250 of us left over that could not get into the barn and so the guards were selected to take us five miles further into the woods to a small farm where the 250 of us would be held overnight. Then we'd be brought back the five miles, which meant that we would be doing double what everybody else was doing. And the guards were furious when they were chosen, and they forced marches the five miles into the, into the little farm uh, stead. And as we arrived, a farmer didn't expect us. No one had told him who we were coming, because there was no way for them to communicate. And he was ordered to take his cows out of the barn, and we were ordered in. The cows had been in the barn since November. And of course, they just piled straw on top of the manure as it piled up, so the stuff was about four feet deep. The thaw had come, and it was real sloppy and messy, and we were herded into this. The cows were standing clear up to their bellies in it. And we slogged our way through that stuff. Well, you get your leg down one of those holes, you couldn't get it out, except you get a hold of your, you know, your leg and pull it out and take the next step. We had nothing to eat for the day, because we always collected our potatoes in the evening, and the farmer was ordered to boil the potatoes for 250 of us. It took about two and a half hours to do that. It was very dark when the potatoes were brought to the barn, and instead of permitting us to file by the door, as was usually the case, and get our two potatoes, the guard simply opened up the door and threw the potatoes in on top of us. Now, we were lying in all of this muck, and the manure, and the urine that had accumulated there for those four months of time, and as the potatoes landed in on us, we were like animals. You know, our beards had grown out here, and our hair was down to our shoulders. We were filthy. We never, I never had my clothing off for 93 days. 
91 days in the march and 93 days total time before my clothing came off. The lice had eaten me raw from the belt to my neckline. It was just one massive scab. All of us were like that. The lice were in our hair. We were half-inch long lice in the hair and the body louse over the rest of us. We were filthy and stinking, and we had slept in manure nearly every night in the barns, and the human excreta as well that was all over the place. Dysentery was rampant through the column all the while. And now it was our opportunity, like animals, dog eat, dog get as many potatoes as you could find. And in the darkness, we'd reach in these holes that the cows had made and that we had made and tromping around in them. And potatoes were on top of the manure and we'd just wipe them off on the shirt and throw them in our mouths and it was get your belly full at the expense of anybody. We're just that kind of animals. Well, you know what happened. The dysentery just broke out as an epidemic and it spread through our column of 1,800 men like lightning. Men died from the dysentery. I had it for 16 days and the Lord miraculously uh, took it away. I can only remember seven days out of the 93. That's all I have retained. God has miraculously and with a great blessing wiped it from my memory. Now you psychiatrists know how all of that happens. It's just wiped clean. I, I don't resurrect it, I guess. It's there, buried within, no doubt, but I can remember seven days only. And I can remember on one of those seven days as I was stumbling along, hardly able to move in the terriblest of agony, I cried out, Oh God, if you exist, if you'll get me out, she's striking a bargain, if you'll get me out, I'll seek you and serve you. And forgot from there on. I don't know what happened from there on. I remember that vow, though. If you get me out, O oh Lord, I'll seek you and serve you. We slept on the ground out in the exposed weather. One day we marched 40 miles, got four potatoes for that 40-mile march. And finally the end came. We were liberated by American blacks in tanks who attached to the British Army, and they roared through the little village where we were held, and now there were only 250 of us left out of the 1,800. We didn't even know we were released. That's how sick we were. Somebody had taken pity on us in that little village and had given Tom Kavine and me a handful of flour. It was filled with weevils. And we'd found a tin can in the barnyard and we'd knocked the manure out of it and put the flour in and gotten some water out of the drinking trough and we had mixed it with a stick. And we were trying to light some manure to cook that paste to have something to eat. And we used our last match. And it went out. You're going to... You know, we were more concerned with the match going out than we were with being liberated. That's how far gone we were. Finally, we were taken back to the lines across the Rhine River, climbing across a bridge that was bombed out, and we were in Allied hands, taken down to Belgium, and then to France, and into one of the evacuation hospitals, and there we began to live again. We were fed baby food for three weeks. We couldn't eat anything else. Placed on a ship and started across the Atlantic, a convoy of 105 ships with the German submarines were still running, got out in the middle of the Atlantic and wouldn't you know our ship, tail end Charlie, the engine quit, and there we were out in the middle of the Atlantic all by ourselves and the convoy pulled away from us and up came a German submarine. And God miraculously sent a Canadian destroyer escort. I don't know where it came from. I didn't see it anywhere. We were all alone. And that Canadian escort came out of nowhere, it seemed, and drove the sub to the bottom. The engine started again, it seemed miraculously, and we were back into the convoy. We arrived in Boston. I hardly know what happened. None of us were even aware that we were hardly home. We were so sick. Placed on a train and sent to the nearest hospital to your home. So those of us who were left, we were scattered all over the Amer America, and I came to California to a hospital in Marysville. There were so many thousands of prisoners coming home that uh, they, they just did not have beds for us. And so if you were able to stand and walk, even with difficulty, you were sent home for three months with no medical treatment. You had to have open wounds and uh, very obvious afflictions that uh, you would not survive without immediate attention. So since I was in that case that I could walk, but with a terrible difficulty, I was sent home for three months. And I will not forget, young people, as I got on that train and headed down to the small town of Martinez on the San Francisco Bay where mother and dad lived. There were five of us in the war, and they were left all alone. 
They didn't know where their sons were at any given time. They had only five communications uh, from me and the government that I was a prisoner. They didn't know whether I was dead or alive. And it was an emotional event for me, and God designed it just perfectly. You know, the Lord never makes a mistake in dealing with us. I believe the Lord arranges everything for us. I don't believe in predestination as such, but I believe that he permits events to take place just right for our situation at any given time. That's why we can say in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And as that train uh, rolled into Martinez and I with difficulty got off and staggered my way to an old rattletrap taxi cab, I told the fellow, go as quickly as you can to 3231 Alhambra Avenue. Mother and dad are there. And I can remember that old thing chugging out Alhambra Avenue and drawing up in front of mother and dad's home. As I stepped out of that taxi and leaned against its side in pain, I looked over the garden fence and up the steps and there framed in the doorway were the faces of mother and dad. You know, I like to think I bounded over the fence and up the steps and into their arms, home again. You know, the Lord arranged that just right so I would understand what it would mean to come to him the first time. Like to a mother and father, the lost son home. See, I could understand now what it would mean to come to my father in heaven. Well, 15 months passed from the time I was shot down until I returned to duty, and as I reported in, I collapsed and was immediately taken to the hospital. And my teeth, when I came from the prison, were so loose I could have extracted every single one of them. You could shake them back and forth, and with the greatest of ease, I could have pulled them out with my fingers, but I was determined I was going to save my teeth and lost only one. And when I uh, collapsed and they took me to the hospital, my mouth looked like a rotten mess with cavities everywhere and the terrible diet that we had suffered. Every tooth, save for two, had cavities. And into the hospital, the intense treatment began. They did all they could for me at Hamilton Air Force Base, and then they sent me to George War uh, to uh, Fort George Wright up in Washington, which was a special hospital for prisoners. And there they began working on my back, and they finally gave up and said, we cannot do anything, it's been too long. You'll just have to live with it the rest of your life. And so I was discharged, 50% disabled. And I returned to Martinez and returned to my job with the Navy at Mare Island Naval Shipyard. And suddenly one day I remembered that vow you made on that death march. If you get me out, I will seek you and serve you. And said, all right, my word is my bond. That's what my father had taught me as I talked to you about last evening. So I started looking for God. And I looked everywhere around Martinez and I couldn't find him. And I drove down to Los Angeles and couldn't find him. I was up and down the streets looking for God. And somebody said, well, you nitwit, you're supposed to look in the church for God. That's where he is. So I started looking in the churches for God. And I didn't find him there either. Now I was looking for a physical God. It seemed like every church I visited, something was wrong. My favorite was to the Catholic Church, but bingo games. Now I said to myself, if this is the Church of God gambling, how can that be? Now I gambled, but I could not understand why I would be in the church. And I went to another church and there was dancing going on into another church of all the Protestant denominations and it seemed like there was always something that was just saying no. And I gave up and I said, there is no God after all. I'm released from the, from the, the pledge I made. And one day I was hooking up my welding equipment at the Navy Yard and I had a fire watch assigned to me, a very short man, who's the most evil creature I have ever met in my life. And he was to watch to see that we didn't catch anything on fire. And the second day on that particular job, we were hooking up our gauges and our cutting torches. And suddenly his elbow was in my side. And he said, hey, let's have some fun. Well, I was always ready for a laugh, and I said, what's the matter? What do, you, what do you want to do? He said, look over there. And coming toward us was a man that was a giant. His shoulders as wide as the pulpit. And he stood about six feet, six inches. A gigantic fellow. One hand was like two of mine, and he had a face to match it all. It was the most ugly thing I've ever seen in my life. And here he came walking toward us. Well, his feet were like that, and it just barges, and he was just coming right straight toward us. 
And this is the one he was pointing to. And as I saw that fellow coming, I recognized him from three occasions previously when I was getting on the Navy bus to leave the yard. I had walked past him. And the three times I walked past him, I felt something just radiating out from him that stabbed right into me. And I backed away from him, afraid, and went way around him to get onto the Navy bus. Three times that had happened, three separate occasions. And lo and behold, he was coming straight toward us. And this little fellow, in his high, squeaky voice, he screeched out, Hey, brother, you better be getting ready to meet your Lord. And men all around dropped their tools and began laughing and mocking this great, huge giant. Well, if he'd done that to any of them, he'd have knocked them over. But he paid not a scant bit of attention to these men who were mocking him. Incidentally, the other day I talked with a man who was dying. And he said, do you remember the giant? I want his faith. I want his faith. He wanted me to tell him how I could have it. One of those who mocked the great giant. It's strange how all things come together in the end, isn't it? And this big fellow just walked right straight down to us, and as he stood in front of me, he looked at that little bit of a fellow, and I'll tell you, his face was so ugly that it would scare the wits out of you. And with a voice that matched it like a foghorn, he said, I am ready to meet my Lord. You're the one who'd better be getting ready. Boy, the atmosphere just vibrated around, and a little fellow got about 10 feet behind me, and he squeaked out and said, don't listen to anything this fellow has to say or read anything he has. You'd be as crazy as he is. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, what's that? I don't know, the union or a lodge or something? And he said, well, he goes to church on Saturday. Have you ever heard of anything so crazy? No, I hadn't heard anything crazy like that before. I didn't know when anybody went to church anyhow. And he ran away and left me with this big moose standing in front of me. And I, I was confused and somewhat afraid, and I didn't know what to say, so I blurted out and said, you go to church on Saturday, do you? Yes, he said. Is there anything wrong in it? Boy, who could argue with that fellow? <laughs> and he said, what day do you go to church on? No, I don't go to church. Well, he said, if you went to f church on Friday like Muslims do, and on Sunday like most Christians, why would you do it? Said, I don't know anything about religion. And he reached into his pocket, and out came a little Bible that disappeared in his hands, and he opened it up and he said, well, this is what God says. And it was the same Bible that I held, same kind of Bible that I held those years before in Lincoln, Nebraska, that Gilbert Henry gave me to read. And he opened it up and he said, this is what God says. Now he never said, this is what I think, this is what the church teaches, this is what I believe, this is what God says. And he gave me a study in five minutes on the Sabbath. And I accepted it instantly. You know, if that's what God said, I'll believe it. I don't know why in the world all of this took place so quickly. It took about, uh, I would say, three minutes to convert me and five minutes for that decision to be made and consummated. A five-minute Bible study on the Sabbath and I was converted. See, all of these things that had happened led up to it. That's why it happened. There's no instantaneous conversion. God's working on it for years with us and it just comes to fruition. It seems suddenly... Well, that was the beginning, young people, of, a, of up to six-hour Bible studies every day. Boy, I'd do my work as fast as I could, and then we'd hide out in freight cars and behind trucks and boxes, and he'd bring out the Bible. Always, this is what God says. Always, this is what the Lord says. It's a beautiful way to give a Bible study, isn't it? Well, my life was changed, and I started attending church immediately. And, oh, mercy, the things that I learned. One day he came to me, and he said, Jimmy, as he called me, Jimmy, if you're going to be a real Christian, you'll have to give up your smoking. Why? I said, why? Because, was his response, your body is a temple of God, and whatever you eat or drink and whatever you do, do it to his glory. And if you don't, the Lord will destroy you. I read it all from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 6, and 10. And I said, well, if that's what God wants, I'll do it. Boy, I didn't know what I was in for. You see, I smoke cigars and a pipe and a pack and a half of cigarettes a day and chewed tobacco besides. And I was nearly dead from it. And I threw away the chewing tobacco, the cigars, and the pipe, but the cigarettes. It took me a month and a half to get down to one. Then I skipped a day, 
Thought I had the victory and was back to pack and a half the next day. And that struggle went on week after week after week after week. And wisely, this old saint of God stayed away from me until I was in absolute agony. And he came to me one day and he said, Jimmy, how are you coming with the cigarettes? I said, I can't do it, Brother Price. Can't do it. Have you prayed about it? Yes, I said as I shot back at him, I've prayed about it and God hasn't done anything. How have you prayed, he said. Lord, help me to stop smoking. Oh, he said as he raised his big ham-like hands over my head, my boy, he said, you will never stop smoking praying like that. And he gave me, young people, a secret for overcoming any sin that afflicts us. I don't care what sin you may mention. I don't care how horrendous it is. He gave the secret for overcoming. Said he, you cannot pray, Lord, help me to stop smoking and have the victory. You must pray, Lord, take away the taste and desire for smoking. Then you will have the victory. That's your secret. Lord, take away the taste and desire for alcohol, tobacco, cursing, hate, sex, whatever it is. There's a taste and desire connected with whatever sin we commit. And that came to me in Revelation then. And oh, I raced for home that night, young people, and I knelt down next to my bed. I still see myself vividly there. I knelt down and I cried out, Oh God, take away the taste and desire for tobacco in Jesus' name. Instantly gone and have never had the desire since. I believe, young people, that we can overcome in Jesus Christ. He will give us the strength. He will take away all of those terrible things. Well, then came the remembrance, I want you for a minister, as he spoke to me over here in Yucca, Arizona. I didn't want to be a minister. I wanted to be a surgeon. And as those days passed of struggle, I was off to Pacific Union College and enrolled, and I was in the hospital every week. I was so sick, I could only take a few hours of classwork. The struggle was horrendous and stupendous to even stay in the school. God gave me my first soul before I was even baptized there at the, at the college. On October 20, 1946, I went into that watery grave and came up in new resurrection in Jesus Christ, giving my life to Him. I met Dorothy at PUC. She was taking French. And she said, French is too difficult. I'm going to take Greek. <laughs> it's one of the most difficult languages going. You know, the Lord arranged it all so I could meet Dorothy in a Greek class. I'd have never met her in a French class, but in Greek class I did. You know, the Lord has something, oh, I think it is just so absolutely wondrous how he, how he arranges things if we permit him to. He has a right companion for you. And maybe he doesn't want you to have a companion. I'm willing to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. After what I've seen him do for me to know that he gave me Dorothy. And oh, that girl has complimented all of my deficiencies so wonderfully. I hope that I have hers. And then the day came and we graduated and went to Southern California. You know what's happened since then. Well, as the years passed, I found it seemed like almost every day that God had something new and wondrous for me to discover so that I could say, thank you, Lord, for everything that has happened. In sickness, lose a loved one, yes, give thanks. Lose your job, yes, give thanks. Your health is broken, yes, give thanks. And God had a lesson for me in 1972, 71. There in Lincoln, I began to be paralyzed again. And so I was taken to the government hospital and the doctors looked me over for about uh, six weeks and said, the only way that we can help you is to fuse your back. This will take a long time because you're too old now. You're older than the age that we would normally do this. And so the election was made to let them go ahead and do this or be paralyzed and in a wheelchair. Now, I did not know what was ahead of me, young people, but it was to be six months of absolute glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was placed in a cast for five months from my neck to my knees. And I lay on my bed on my back and my left side for those five months, hardly able to move. Towards the end, I could walk a bit with the aid of crutches. And for five months, I had the upward look instead of the outward look. And it seemed like those five months, a total of six months in the hospital, was but as a day because of the upward look. Oh, I thank God for those five months in the cast. Unable to move. 
except to look up. I have very few days that I do not have pain. I have pain now. I can feel it rather intensely from just standing too long. Thank you, Lord, for the pain. Because uh, I can remember the times that I don't have it. There's always something to be thankful for. As I sat at the principal's uh, table today for lunch, oh, what a glorious meal. And last night with Elder and Mrs. Schmidt, oh boy. All I can think of is you know, potatoes and rotten cabbage. And you can be thankful indeed for the blessings and bounties that God gives to us. You know, every day is Thanksgiving Day as I sit at the table when I reflect back and remember. And dressed in rags and filth for those 93 days, oh, thank you, God, for clean clothing. A clean and warm bed and a shower. You know, we take, every, we take these things as, as something that's just an everyday occurrence without giving thanks for them. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, we can just be filled with thanksgiving unto God throughout the entire day. I do not believe that would be my experience now. It's not as well as it should be. Except all of it had been denied. But you don't have to go through that kind of an experience. Give the joyful thanks to the Lord like, uh, like Paul says, uh, says for us to do in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It doesn't say give thanks only for the good things, but in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I want a more thankful heart for the wonderful love of my Savior Jesus Christ. And Lord, if it's your desire that we be afflicted more. Thank you, Lord. Just help me to respond as you want me to. Thank you, Lord, for the 11 foods I can eat. But if you want to take it away, Lord, and give me two or three, thank you, Lord. Because I know that he will do only that which is best for me to lead me home. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name.